Hello, I'm Jake Stone. I'm Jesse Owens. And we welcome you to another episode of Generally Particular, a production of the London Lyceum. Generally Particular is a show dedicated to discussing and reflecting on the whole Baptist story. We are a show by Baptists, about Baptists, and for Baptists, as well as Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and today our two groups that we're giving a shout out to, the Berengarians and the Hussites. So if you're of one of those groups and listening, we welcome you. Although one could argue that both of those groups were proto-Baptist in a way. All right. I'm a Calvinist Baptist. Jesse is an Arminian Baptist. In the 17th and 18th centuries, we would have been known as a particular Baptist and a general Baptist. And so what we think is a fun show to talk about the Baptist way, we've joined those together for Generally Particular. We're excited because today we're beginning a new series. We're entitling this Baptist Bios. And we're hoping over the next several weeks to spotlight and discuss some great men, talk about them and their lives and their theological contributions as they have been in the Baptist stream. And we're using two resources that will kind of uh, shape what we're going to discuss. The first is this very recent book, Arminian Baptist, A Biographical History of Free Will Baptist, edited by David Little and Charles Cook. And our very own Dr. Jesse F. Owens has contributed some chapters in this book. So we know that we'll have to discuss his chapters because it'll be something he knows about. And then we will also be using, which we've talked about this book before, Theologians of the Baptist Tradition, editors Timothy George and David Dockery. Now, before we dive into this week's episodes, we have a couple of rants to go on real quick. The first one is that we were not going to start this series until our next recording because we wanted to do another of our Jawin episodes, and it was going to be with the president of the London Lyceum, Jordan Stefaniak. But if anybody has ever followed Jordan's social media a little bit, you'll notice that Jordan is a fall Tennessee volunteer fan. What I mean by that is he only ever says anything about Tennessee volunteer football if they happen to win a game. For example, last year, he made it a point to show his sons watching the game against Alabama. Never seen a picture of that in all the time that I've known Jordan. Never seen him post anything like that. It's true. But what do we know happened? We're recording this on October the 24th, the year of our Lord, 2023. Jordan's not with us because the third Saturday of October 2023 happened this past weekend. Things did not go very well for Tennessee. Yes, according to some people like Clay Travis, they had an outstanding first half, one for the ages, <laughs> uh, something that no Nick Saban team has ever seen. It was 20-7 to 7 at the half, but Jesse, can you tell our audience, what was the final score of the game? Mm, it was 34-20. to 34-20, to 20. that means Alabama outscored them 27 to nothing. Yeah. Folks, we play 60 minutes, not 30. So Jordan is there in his home, I guess, uh, still finding a way. Maybe he's like, we won't say all, but a few Tennessee fans who've rewatched that game from Saturday over and over and over to get every freeze frame possible to explain that the refs were on the side of Alabama. You know, the <laughs> they forget last year Alabama had 17 penalties called against them, including the phantom pass interference that negated an interception that would have ended the game and Alabama would have won. But these are trivial matters. So, Jesse, how are you doing today? I'm still enjoying that Alabama win. Yes. It was great. Yeah, it was I great. I will go ahead and confess that after the first half, let's just say I was in the valley of despair. Mm. I was in the, the, the despondent's dungeon. Giant despair. It was all over me. But when that game ended, I had risen to the celestial city. Mm. I was a happy man. No, I had to turn the game off at halftime because I, I, I was having a hard time with it, I'll admit. And so I thought, well, I may turn it back on later. But then Jake texted me and said, keep it off. They're, no, I they're, told him, yeah. They're, they're coming back, you know. I mean, so clearly my turning the game off had caused them to turn things around. So then I had to go the rest of the game, just kind of keeping up with the score on the ESPN app and getting updates from, from Jake. So 
do what you do what it takes, you know, you do yeah. whatever it takes. We do what we take. And, and, and I will, one of my good friends who I usually watch all the Alabama games with up here, my friend, Andrew Hendon uh, said that I'm the most negative Alabama fan that he knows. When I reported that to my dad, my dad's response was quote, that ain't no lie. End quote. <laughs> so, so anyway, I can be cynical. But anyway, we are enjoying it. Alabama has a bye week, and so my heart uh, can recover. The second thing is, is I was distraught, though, last night. Um, one, one, of, one of my favorite professors here at Southern Seminary, Dr. John D. Wilsey, who is a great historian and a great teacher. But even our heroes have flaws. Mm. Last night in class, Dr. Wilsey shared that he does not like potatoes and he does not like shrimp. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's a place back home that has a baked potato with boiled shrimp and cheese and it's melted and a little crab meat on top. I don't know how anybody could eat that and say it wasn't any good. It would almost <laughs> make me question whether they're regenerate or not. Mm. So, folks, don't have bad food takes like that. Potatoes are good, and shrimp is good. You can eat shrimp anyway. You can eat potato anyway. Now, I'm going to cut Jesse off because I know where he's going to go here in just a second. I, <laughs> I like want it so bad. I, 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 I do not if like anyone. Potato. If anyone is just listening to this, you've got to watch the YouTube version. I'm trying. I was trying so hard. To, I was just going to let it go. I was I was just going to be a friend and let it go. Potato salad is nasty. Oh. It's nasty. Jake also doesn't like collards. No. Or, tur I, or turnips. Now, now, people, look at greens. Potatoes and greens are not the same thing. If you're going to show me skillet fried potatoes and collard greens. You don't, you don't have to choose, Jake. You don't have to choose. No, I'm just telling you that they're not the same. I, there's a lot of people who reject the greens. I don't know very many people who reject those skillet potatoes. Mm, how about potato salad? I, I, the, who, I don't like, I, I know some people who don't. Okay. I think when I think about potato salad, the first church I pastored, there was a man there. Who, he made German style potato salad. And that is even. Yeah. Well, potato we salad and devil, for me in the South at church feeds, Potato salad and deviled eggs were the same thing in my mind to be avoided at all cost. Oh, you don't like deviled eggs either? No. Oh. Oh, my. Quick story real quick. We don't have time to go into all of it, but I'll just tell our audience. One time I went and preached at this church. I'd never preached there before in my life, didn't know anybody. They were looking for a pastor. By the time I got finished preaching that sermon, an older man tried to call me for pastor that afternoon. It was one of the most bizarre moments of my life that's why i remember that trip my dad remembers was it, that. In, was it in a business meeting no i just oh. i was there to start the revival meeting i was just the visiting I thought you meant they went into i thought you meant they like went into an emergency oh, no, business he just said, i make a motion see what happened is they called a guy and the guy that they called showed up and he spoke before we even started the service and told him he wasn't taking it and then he left um mm. he didn't stay for, for me to preach um, and it was providential then, that you were still there yeah, I was there, and so they got turned down twice in one Sunday. I felt bad for them, but uh, my dad remember my dad remembers that that service um, the most, not because of that, but because in his mind the best deviled eggs he's ever had in his life were there. Uh, somebody made some with crab meat in them. So uh, I'm just glad to know it doesn't extend to the whole family. It's just a Jake problem. Yeah, it's that. But here's the thing: my dad does not have the sweet tooth that I do either. Mm. I mean, my dad, you could put a piece of chocolate cake in front of my dad with vanilla ice cream and fudge drizzled on it. Or then you gave him a piece of buttermilk pound cake. He goes for the pound cake. Now, I like pound cake, but if I've got to pick between pound cake and <laughs> the, the, the chocolate cake and ice cream and fudge, I'm going with that any day over the pound mm. cake. So, yeah. Well, from that, we go to Thomas Helwes, who did not. Natural, have natural segue is I heard that the the um, the Puritans and uh, pilgrims came over looking for a decent meal. So 
Look, when you go and when you go read what they had for the first Thanksgiving, and we we see what we have in Thanksgiving in the South, just three words: God bless America. So <laughs> we ain't eating no eel pie. So uh, mm. thank the Lord. Oof. So. With that, let's talk about Thomas Helwes, who sadly never had any fried chicken um, in his life. However, we have all eternity to look forward to, and no doubt we will enjoy it. So, Jesse is going to lead our discussion today because we're talking about a general Baptist. And I know that that's a little bit more of his expertise than mine. And so he's going to lead our discussion on Thomas Helwes. And um, but let me just say, first of all, that uh, this is uh, very important. These men that we are going to be looking at through this series, whether we have uh, disagreements with them or not, we can uh, be very thankful for their influence, their example. Um, obviously, we'll talk about it a little bit. I would have disagreements with Thomas Helwes on, you know, the doctrine of election and some things. But I definitely consider myself someone who is a recipient of his life, his ministry, and admire uh, his courage, his steadfastness, and what he contributed to the Baptist story. So, Jesse, who is Thomas Helwes? Yeah, maybe just a sort of brief introduction, and then we can talk about some of his different theological views and, uh, and whatnot. Um, we don't know the exact dates of Helwes's birth. He was born sometime around 1575. And uh, by 1593 and 1595, he studied law uh, in London at Gray's Inn. And then around 1595, he was married to a lady named Joan Ashmore. Um, and apparently the home that Helwes and Joan Ashmore lived in, Broxtow Hall, uh, they allowed some separatists to kind of convalesce in their home when they were ill or traveling or things like that. And some think that this is, it's its during this period after they're married, but at Broxtow Hall that Helwes would have encountered another man by the name of John Smith. And John Smith is really important, a really central figure in the Thomas Helwes story. And uh, so, so we'll talk a little bit uh, about him. So um, Helwes and Smith would have interacted sometime in the early 1600s. Uh, Smith would have actually been a minister in the, the Church of England, and uh, he was educated at Christ College, Cambridge. But, uh, but Smith came to hold a separatist view, and so he was a Puritan first, and then he became a separatist. And sometime around 1607, maybe 1608, Thomas Helwes and John Smith and some others actually flee persecution in England uh, in order to go to Holland. Now, prior to that, maybe sometime in 1606, Helwes and Smith had been involved with a couple of congregations. Uh, one is the Gainsborough Congregation and one is the Scrooby Congregation. Uh, and Smith ends up pastoring the Gainsborough Congregation. And then John Robinson, who uh, some people might be familiar with, and Richard Clifton and some others are involved in, uh, in the Scrooby congregation. And they eventually sort of go, the, go their separate ways, primarily over the issue of uh, baptism. Uh, but, but anyways, Smith and Helwes are over in England. Uh, I'm sorry, are over in Holland. And, uh, and there, um, Smith, over a period of time... Um, uh, begins to em embrace believers' baptism, as as does Helwes, and Smith uh, baptizes himself, and sometimes this is referred to as se baptism, and uh, but then Smith, you know, to, this is kind of an oversimplification, but Smith over a period of just a few years begins to embrace um, a Waterlander Mennonite view, an Anabaptist view of a variety of things. Helwes seems to be concerned, certainly by 1610, 1611 for sure, uh, that uh, Smith has embraced an Anabaptist view of the relationship between Christians and the civil magistrate, uh, thinking that Christians should not serve in, um, in the civil government in, in any way. 
And then Helwes is also concerned that Smith has embraced um, a view of, uh, of succession uh, that the Anabaptists held to. And then one of his real um, significant concerns um, was that Smith had embraced what's sometimes referred to as Hoffmanite Christology or celestial flesh Christology. And that is a belief that Jesus did not receive his flesh, his body, uh, from, from Mary, but that he received it through a direct act of the Holy Spirit apart from, uh, from, from Mary's actual uh, body. And so sometime around 1610, 1611, Smith and Helwes uh, kind of go their, their separate ways. Um, in fact, and this is something we can talk about in a moment, but Helwes actually pens a confession of faith in 1610. And you can see in that confession of faith that he actually at that time holds some of Smith's views, like he rejects the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity. But then in 1611, uh, just prior to Helwes and a, and a group who, who followed him when he separated from Smith, um, they publish a, a, a second confession of faith. And it's in that confession of faith that we see um, where Smith and Helwes had, I think, believed some form of, uh, of, of Calvinist theology prior to and had, had jettisoned that. I think Helwes seems to make a move back to a at least some level of a Reformed understanding of certain doctrines. And you can see that transition from these two confessions of faith. But Smith wants to clarify, he wants to distinguish himself and his theology and the theology of, of those who are, are a part of his congregation from that of Smith, since Smith has sort of uh, attempted to join with the Waterlander Mennonites. I think by 1615, uh, those who had sort of followed Smith actually do join with the Waterlander Mennonites. Uh, but in 1612, and this is where I'll kind of just finish with this, and then we can talk about some of his actual theology. In, in 1612, Smith and this congregation that had followed him actually go back to England, and they established the first Baptist congregation on English soil, um, right in London, an area I think is just outside of the city wall at that time, in an area called Spitafields. And um, and how was pastors, the congregation, he actually writes, uh, they discuss this. Um, uh, he feels as if he's, he's fled England to avoid persecution for a period of time, which he thought was necessary. His wife has stayed behind. They think that she probably stayed with, uh, some family. Um, she was actually imprisoned for a period of time, but Helwes goes back with his congregation and he knows that this is probably going to, uh, to cost him dearly, you know, cost him maybe his life. And so they go back in 1612. Um, he pens a work entitled the, the mystery of iniquity and, uh, where he argues against, uh, the use of sort of magisterial authority within the church. He distinguishes between the role of the civil magistrate in governing society at large and the role of Christ in the governance of the church. And he actually says, um, to, uh, to, um, to James the first, uh, that the King is just a mortal man and not a God. And he has no right, no rule, uh, within Christ church. And he's, he pins this, there's a, a handwritten note, uh, at the beginning of, uh, a copy of mystery of iniquity. And, and it was actually, I think, given to James the first. Well, it, it ends up that Helwes ends up in Newgate prison because of this likely. Um, and it's there that Helwes dies in Newgate from as, as far as we can tell sometime around 1615 or 1616. So that's kind of a brief overview of his life. A couple of points to make clarification so that our audience knows, first of all, the John Smith we were talking about is not the John Smith connected to Pocahontas. So we want to make that clear. <laughs> although, although um, there, there is a sort of, uh, there's some connections there in the sense that uh, some of those involved in with these early Baptists actually did come over on the, on the Mayflower, but, right. Uh, but right. Not the same John Smith. Yeah. And then uh, Jesse, just real quick for our audience, because they, they may have heard you use a couple of terms and we just want to make sure everybody understands what is the difference between a Puritan and a separatist at this time? Yeah, so so um, 
Helwes in his book, Mystery of Iniquity, talks a little bit, he addresses uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of England, the Puritans, and the Separatists. He, he, he engages with all of these. And maybe this will be a helpful way of explaining it. He says concerning the Church of England, he doesn't think that they've, they've distinguished themselves enough from the Roman Catholics. Uh, he just says there's too much in uh, the Church of England um, that mirrors what, uh, what, what would have been in Roman Catholicism. And then Puritans would have those, been those who remained within the Church of England, but wanted to see certain types of reforms within the Church of England. So they hadn't given up on the Church of England altogether, but they wanted to see some sort of reform within the church. They wanted to see a purification of the Church of England. Then separatists were those who thought that uh, the Church of England was essentially couldn't be recovered. It, it was too far gone. Uh, maybe they didn't believe that the Church of England was a true church at all. Um, and Helwes and Smith seem to have, have come to that conclusion, as did many other Baptists, um, by the way. And, uh, and so they would become separatists. Now, separatists, even some separatists, the early separatists and some of the ones in Holland, uh, retained infant baptism. So you have some who would leave the Church of England uh, as separatists, but would still retain infant baptism. And Helwes's critique of the Puritans and the separatists is the Puritans had remained within the Church of England, and he just thought it was too far gone. He would say to the separatists, you have withdrawn from the Church of England rightly, but you have retained infant baptism, which leads to um, the wrong way of gathering the church, uh, which is through repentance and faith and then believers baptism. Um, there's some debate, you know, about when people started actually baptizing by immersion. That's that's a debate a lot of times in Baptist studies and Baptist history. But at this point, um, Smith and Helwes both come to the conclusion that the Bible teaches believers baptism. We're not exactly sure uh, if they baptized by pouring or, or what it might have been at this point. But separatist, anyways, to go back to your initial point, question, would have been those who would have separated entirely from the Church of England. Some became Baptists like Helwes. Uh, some retained infant baptism like some of the, those that Smith and Helwes had interacted with in, uh, in Holland. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, as we're dealing with Helwes' theology, and that we can kind of begin to see that very clear in the confessional documents. Let me, first of all, ask this question. Um, one of the most important documents that comes out of the separatist movement is a true confession. Does that confession have any influence at all on this group? I do know that it be, it's very much a foundation for the first London Baptist Confession, is there any connection that you've seen between a true confession and these early documents put forward by Smith and Helwes? Yeah, you know, that's a, a good question. Um, it's been a long time since I've thought about that. I, I would have to, to look again. I'm not so sure. That was a short answer, wasn't it? It was. I, you know, you don't have to be precise. Just go with your gut, you know. Yeah, I, I really, I, I don't like, I, you know how I am. I like to be precise. I don't, I don't like to, I'm not sure. I don't know. He, he, he's too, he, Jesse sometimes reminds me of an engineer. He's kind of got <laughs> that, that mindset. You now me, you know, just keep talking and you'll get there at some point. All right. Yeah. So, um, then let's talk about, the, talk about the confessions with, with Helwes and Smith. So we have Smith's is the short confession of faith. <laughs> in 1610 that's correct for 1609 1610 is that right so uh, so um after helwes broke with smith in 1610 um yeah he wrote a declaration of faith of english people remaining at amsterdam in holland so that's um, the helwes confession that's right that that's the one where he sort of distinguishes himself from from smith that's correct yeah, now, we need, we, you need to go ahead and share with our our audience whether you have made a pilgrimage to Amsterdam to the Mennonite archives so that you could see John Smith's actual original confession because uh, we know that you hold to the Anabaptist theory. So is that yeah, correct? yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Have you been there? 
I haven't, but that I haven't, but that would be great. I've uh, I was able to to do a bit um, of traveling and and some stuff in England a few years ago. Not not as much as I would like to. Uh, that we need to get a London Lyceum or generally particular travel tour going. That's what we need to do. Go to some of these sites, but uh, then. <laughs> but I haven't. But I would I would love to. Uh, I would love to. I would love to see that. So so the sixteen ten. Uh, confession with um, Smith. Yeah. So I said this earlier, but they were, they, um, it rejects imputation um, very, very clearly. Now, some of the framework of what you find in the 1611 confession of a declaration of faith of English people remaining at Amsterdam and Holland, you find a similar framework of the confession, but it's very clear that Helwes's theology has changed. So for instance, in article two, he says, uh, concerning Adam, through whose disobedience all men sinned. And he, he refers to Romans 5. And then he said, his sin, Adam's sin, is imputed to all. And so death went over all men. And then he says, concerning our sort of disposition, he says that all men fallen, having all disposition to evil and no disposition or will to any good, uh, yet God giving grace, many may receive grace. And then he says, concerning justification, a man is justified only by the righteousness of Christ. So anyways, his, his understanding of the effects of the fall and of human nature and the necessity of uh, the imputation of Christ's righteousness uh, and the imputation of Adam's sin to all of humanity is, is a significant development in his theology. And I would say a, a significant move back towards reformed theology. And one of the things that, that Matt Pinson points out in this chapter, which I think is helpful, is Helwes's theology as a, I think what we could call now uh, an Arminian, although he wouldn't have identified himself by any means uh, in that way, is, is quite close to the soteriology of Arminius. Now, not on baptism, um, but on some of these other issues, it, it is quite, quite similar and is a significant deviation from where John Smith had ended up. I want to make a point here, you know, talking about we, we did this show to talk about the whole story. And I know sometimes people might think that we're a secret um, Tom Nettle Stan account here. We make no secret about it. I was about it. to say, I don't I don't know that it's much. But of a secret. when I took Dr. Nettles, one of the things, you know, we spent time talking about these men, Thomas Helwes and John Smith, and we worked through uh, the confessional documents in that class. And I was very struck by. The things that you've noted also in um, would be Article 8 of Helwes' Confession. And you, we can see, and I remember Dr. Nettles pointing this out, the pushback against, we would say, some of the errors among the Mennonites. Helwes says this about Christology, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person, or subsistence, just thinks fascinating that that term is used, in the Trinity, in the fullness of time, was manifested in the flesh, being the seed of David and of the Israelites according to the flesh and the son of Mary, the virgin made of her substance by the power of the Holy Ghost overshadowing her and being thus true man like unto us in all things, sin only accepted, being one person in two distinct natures, true God and true man. And so very much you can see that this early, you know, I don't think it's wrong for us to use the term Baptist confession is seeking to follow orthodoxy in these matters. Yeah. Now, I, I have a question, and so you have to make a judgment call here. So, <laughs> William Lumpkin, in his book, here, Baptist Confessions of Faith, that I'm that I'm citing from, he makes this statement about the, the, the Hell Was Confession, and I'm curious if you would agree with how he frames it or not. He says about this confession, Mennonite influence is readily seen in the confession, for it shows a departure from the hitherto markedly consistent Calvinism of the separatist movement, but it shows also decided signs of its author's Calvinistic background. It is anti-Calvinistic on the doctrine of the atonement and anti-Arminian in the views of sin and the will. Obviously, it owed much to John Smith, though it goes beyond his confessions at a number of points. Would you agree or disagree or modify? 
that assessment. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're thinking about them being in in Holland. So to me, denying that they might have had some interaction with the Anabaptists, which they clearly did, um, and that there might have been some exchange of, of ideas uh, in theology, I, you know, I, I don't see how you can just deny that completely out of hand. I will say, though, that, you know, the idea, and again, it's, it would be anachronistic to refer to this as Arminianism, but the, the, one of the things that Pinson rightly points out is the debate concerning Arminius, and Arminius's theology is raging on the continent at this time right. when they're over there. So I, you know, I don't think it's entirely outside of the realm of possibilities that on soteriology, the influence might not have necessarily been the Anabaptist. It, it could have been through Arminius's own teachings and Arminius's own writings, uh, and, and the publication and the and the spread of those things. So to have, you know, I think I think there is some element. I think Lumpkin is right to an extent, and this is kind of what I was trying to say a moment ago. There, there is a certain reformed emphasis in Helwes' soteriology uh, that I'm extremely thankful for. And I think it's something that you see in, in, in a lot of general Baptist theologians actually throughout the 17th century. And you see quite a bit of it in uh, Thomas Grantham and certainly a lot of it in, in Thomas Monk. Um, but, you know, I, maybe Helwes is, is exposed to the ideas of, of Arminius uh, on soteriology. So there's a way of, of not being Calvinistic, if, if we want to say that, uh, that doesn't require you to be heavily influenced on soteriology by the Anabaptists. And it seems as if, if, if anything, Helwes is mostly averse to much of what he's uh, encountered in Anabaptist theology. Now, again, on baptism, on believers' baptism, on some other things. That's not to say that there isn't some interaction and potentially some some influence there. I, I don't see how you could say that there's just no way that that's the case. But um, but certainly Smith and Helwes would have been exposed to to reform teaching, to, to Calvinist teaching prior to their coming to Holland. And maybe some of it's just a return to some of those things, but it's modified in some way, maybe through the teachings of Arminius uh, it seems more consistent with the teachings of Arminius than it does than what we have in some other Anabaptist theology. Okay, so let's talk about in the, the book, Dr. Pinson's chapter on Thomas Helwes. He makes a statement about what is the, the legacy of Thomas Helwes. And he makes the statement that it is twofold. That first of all, he was the first person in the English-speaking world to advocate the doctrine of full religious liberty or liberty of conscience. Often Roger Williams is thought of in, in this regard, but it was Thomas Helwes who wrote the first articulation defense of religious liberty in the English language in his Mystery of Iniquity. We've covered this subject in previous episodes, and we've shown where language that is found in Roger Williams is really, it's trickled down to him from uh, things that are from Helwes in the, the Mystery of Iniquity. And, then, and by the way, let me say real quick yeah. while, while we're on this, and some of that through John Merton, this is right. something I didn't say, uh, but Merton is one of, um, uh, is, seems to be kind of ministering alongside how was he's involved in his congregation there in Spitafields. And Merton actually uh, seems to assume the pastorate of that, that congregation after Helwes's death. And so he's involved in that as some as well. And then he says, second of all, we consider Helwes the founder of the Baptist movement as we know it today. That distinction goes to him since Smith abandoned Baptist theology for Mennonite theology. Unfortunately, Dr. Pinson does not hold to the trail of blood theory because we would say that it actually goes back to John at the Jordan. So um. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get the uh, who, who all do we have to get? The Waldensians, the Albigensians. Donatist. Team Donatist. Do we get the Hussites in there at all? Hussites, the Paul, well, but see, I don't think they ever immersed. Um, definitely know. the Lollards. The Lollards are huge. The Paulicians. The are huge. I so here's what I want to say: N neither of us would would affirm that, but it is interesting if you read some of these histories from oh, yeah. this from the 18th century. Um, some of those histories actually start with some version of that. So I'm always a little, a little fascinated. It's not exactly a, uh, 
it's certainly not exactly a 20th century invention. You have a little bit of, of it there pretty early on. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we, we, you know, there's some things that we, we're saying tongue in cheek about Baptist successionism and all. But I will say that I do, as someone who grew up in landmarkism, I will say that, you know, as you start diving into the Baptist tradition, it is not J.M. Carroll or J.R. Graves who invented these things. As we're saying, you know, people like Thomas Crosby, you know, so we're going back into the early 1700s, were making not exactly the same arguments. Yeah, but they were. They held forms of it. Is what they we're weren't arguing that this was necessary, right. you know, that there had to be some existence of believers baptism among some group from John the Baptist all the way to the present. But they but a lot of times and I think Adam Taylor does this in his history. They do trace you know, where they do think baptism existed among these various groups. Again, not out of some sort of successionism, like it, it was a necessity, but but they do trace it out a little bit. So uh, it, I don't know. It, it's always it been a remnant. Of, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating sort of thing. Yeah. So um, let's talk, we, you know, we wanted for just very briefly, we've hit on this already a little bit, his doctrine of salvation. Let me ask you a question, Jesse. You, you, you're talking about that at the same time, that Thomas Helwes is developing these views. So as we look at his soteriology, we would say that his view on sin and depravity sounds very, for lack of a better term, Calvinistic. All right, we would say that it has a very much a Calvinistic ring to it. His view on election, predestination, the atonement, and then eternal security has more of what we would say a, a non-Calvinistic um, leaning to it because it, it is hard mm -hmm. to say Arminian at this point because you know that's that's still sure. being developed at that point. Sure. How though do you would you understand? And Dr. Pinson brings this out. If you you know I know we we get in trouble if we're not careful because we are wanting to be get good historians and so we don't want to make judgment calls in a sense, but. How, how do you think from Thomas Helwig's perspective, you know, he writes that, you know, free will doth utterly abolish Christ and destroy faith and set up works for free will is to have absolute power and a man's self to work righteousness. Mm -hmm. So how would you understand that statement from him in his context as we're thinking about, is he being inconsistent? Is his soteriology inconsistent? would you say? So you didn't quote this, but uh, he, he, he refers to free will as that most damnable heresy. I thought it would sound better for you to say that than me. Yeah. So, so I was actually looking that back up earlier in, in his writings. He refers to free will as that most damnable heresy. And I think what he's pushing back against is Pelagianism and, and you know, what sometimes gets thrown around, although I don't know that it's that helpful, uh, as semi-Pelagianism. So what he wants to say, though, is kind of like he says uh, in his confession, and that is within the natural man, there is no inclination, no disposition towards that which is good. Man's inclination, his disposition uh, is always towards that which is evil. And so it's only through a, a gracious work of God that that man would ever come to repentance and faith. So that's what he means by free will, um, is that because of the effects of sin, the effects of the fall, uh, there's no way, no sense in which uh, the natural man will choose God, will freely choose God. Uh, faith is not within the realm of possibilities for the natural man. Uh, there must be a work of the spirit and a work of, of grace. So I think he's pushing back against those who would attribute some sort of Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism uh, to him. Now, um, I don't think that he, he goes the, the full way on uh, rejecting you know, free will in the way that you know, maybe Calvin or Luther or certainly Edwards or someone like that would. Uh, but th this idea that there's sort of a Pelagian or semi-Pelagian view that Arminians must hold about free will, uh, he, he would reject that. He would say it's necessary uh, for God to graciously act 
in the individual to make faith within the realm of possibilities for the natural man uh, choosing that which is good, having any sort of disposition towards or inclination towards that which is good is not possible. But we as Calvinists do believe in free will. We have a whole chapter on it in our confession. Moving on then, just to, just to make that clear. We, we differ on how we explain that. But we yeah, I mean, I, are, yeah, I mean, certainly, obviously, certainly by the time you get to, to Edwards, uh, there are all sorts of distinctions. And within the Reformed tradition, there are all sorts of distinctions. This is, by the way, one of the arguments that Pinson makes, and I think it's a really important one. Um, and, he, and he's made this distinction in talking about Arminius as well, and it's not one that we'll go into necessarily on, the, on this podcast. Although I think Jordan is supposed to have him on the London Lyceum sometime, so maybe he'll make it there. Um, there's a very real sense in which on, soti- on many of the things that you would find on, on soteriology that Helwes could have affirmed and, Armi- uh, could have affirmed and Arminius did affirm uh, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, but, um, but could he have affirmed Dort, you know, absolutely not. And so this is one of the things that Pinson talks about is there's sort of a crystallization of reformed theology. Uh, by the time you get to the Senate of Dort, that's different than what there was before. And I think it's the reason you see a lot of variety within the reformed tradition. I mean, shoot, you see a lot of variety within, within Westminster, I mean, just think about all of the debates that are occurring on, at Westminster. By the way, even on things like imputation, Thomas Helwes affirms the necessity of the imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer and imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity. Uh, and, uh, and you get something of even active and passive obedience, the imputation of Christ's active and passive obedience. And there's some at Westminster who don't even affirm that. So... It's interesting. There, there is some variety within the Reformed tradition. I think Oliver Crisp has pointed this out as well as some, as some others. Um, so sure, yeah, on some of these matters, there, there are plenty of nuances and differences and developments over time. But, uh, but anyway. Jesse doesn't believe in black and white in theology. He's all about the gray. So, <laughs> you know, I, will say, I, I will say that the more that you actually read and kind of dive into the primary literature, you can kind of see that there is a little bit more um, new. There's more nuance than usually gets that gets presented. Well, and sometimes there's even development. We'll talk about this in a later episode, but um, you know, to stick with Helwes, there's a significant difference between what Helwes affirms in 1610 and what Helwes affirms in 1611. Sure. And you can find this in some particular Baptists where their views change over time on things like justification and all sorts of things. So, yeah, I mean, history is much more, much more nuanced sometimes than, than we're, you know, than we'd like to admit. I love categories and labels, but they are, and they're helpful, but they don't always tell the full story. So, to speak. yeah. Can I just say, we, we probably shouldn't go too much longer, but I will say, um, one of probably Helwes's most significant contribution is on the relationship between religious toleration or religious liberty and ecclesiology. So I don't want to hammer it again because we've talked about it a ton on this, this episode, but for Helwes, religious liberty or religious toleration and ecclesiology are sort of inseparably linked. Uh, Helwes would say, would think that a, a society that allows the civil magistrate to rule um, both uh, civil society and the church almost always would affirm some sort of like infant baptism, but then you have the wrong formation of the church. And so he, he, he just sees these things as, as necessarily linked. Um, but, but he makes all sorts of ecclesiological arguments about religious toleration and religious liberty. And I think those are probably his most significant contributions. Uh, let me just say one other thing, and that's something you mentioned earlier. Helwes, um, sometimes the general Baptists are critiqued for having less than precise language on the doctrine of the Trinity. And this comes up a lot of times in discussions about, the, about Matthew Caffin and the Standard Confession. One of the things you saw very clearly in Article 8 of a Declaration of Faith is Helwes is not hesitant whatsoever to use words like Trinity, 
and subsistence and natures and, and all sorts of things. So that is not an integral part of Baptist uh, theology. It's certainly not an integral part of general Baptist theology. That's not to say we don't have some deviation in the 17th century, but you know, when you go back to this, this original confession uh, in Helwes, you know, you, you don't see it there. He, he's not afraid to sort of draw on, like you said, the Orthodox tradition and things like Chalcedon. Yeah, if I can just say, I think Helwes' statement on the church is just a great, concise definition that, you know, all Baptists of all time would heartily say amen that the church of Christ is a company of faithful people separated from the world by the word and spirit of God being knit together unto the Lord and unto one another by baptism upon their own confession of faith and sins. What a great concise definition of, I would say what Baptists believe about the nature of the church. And so you can see that. And I would say, you know, this is the first time this has ever been this kind of language in a confession codified. And also mm -hmm. Dr. Pinson put, put very well that very much what is fueling um, hell is, is, is a very much this, he's just taking what he received from the Puritan tradition of the regulative principle of worship. And what does the Bible teach about the church, how the ordinances are to be conducted, that it's the scripture that frames these things and not, you know, our own opinions. Yeah. Well, anything else, Jesse, that we, we should take away from Thomas Helwes or what, or is there anywhere else that you would point our audience to, to learn more about him and from him? Yeah, that's a, that's good. Um, I mean, Pinson's chapter in this book is really short. The, this book is, we're, we're not going to discuss all of the figures in here. Some of them are uniquely free will Baptist. Um, and we might discuss some of those, but his chapter here on Thomas Helwes is, is pretty short. He has some material on Helwes in a book called Arminian and Baptist that I think is really good. And I've read that book and wrote a nice review of it. I thought it was a yeah. good book. There is another book um, on Helwes's ecclesiology that... Um, By Marvin Jones. Yeah, the beginnings of Baptist ecclesiology, which I think is his dissertation, mm -hmm. and he talks about how Helwes gets he's most often known for his views on religious liberty, but you know much of what he's emphasizing is ecclesiology, and I would just say both of those things are related. But I think Marvin Jones does a really good job of tracing that out um, pretty clearly. You can always go to the Helwes Society Forum, vhsf.com. And we have some essays on there about Thomas Helwes uh, that I've written and maybe some others have written as well. So those are some other places that you could look. Um, if you really just wanted to get a sense of Helwes's writings, uh, there's this really nice book from Mercer University Press. I don't know if it's still in print. Uh, the Life and Writings of Thomas Helwes by Joe Early Jr. Uh, it's in this English Baptist text series. And it's really good um, if you just kind of wanted to get a, a general sense of his theology with some commentary from from early yeah. before we we sign off today jesse why don't you share with our audience what you'll be doing this weekend i will oh i will be running a half marathon in indianapolis yeah yeah. So here's what's funny so i i got into running because of jesse's uh encouragement a few years ago and Jesse always has a way of making me feel like I've done nothing. So um, I can go for a five mile run in a day and thought, wow, I, I did well. You know, then I see because we use the same app to record on. Then I can see he went and ran 10 miles and so did double what I did. And so I was feeling great about myself. And then I see that I ran five. He ran 10. So you know what I do? <laughs> I just go get a donut, you know, so, so, so I try yeah. my father. So. Sometimes Jake will send me uh, his dinner and he'll, you know, it'll be, I don't know, like a pizza or something. And, and what do you say? You're like, I earned it today. That's right. I did. I earned it. And yeah. then he, then Jesse will say, wow, you're really going to have to earn it some more tomorrow morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might have said, I'm not sure how far five miles is going to take you on a pizza, but yeah. Yeah. Jesse always destroys my self-esteem when it comes to exercise and food. So. Well, you've got plenty of it, so yeah. you'll be okay. <laughs> 
All right. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our first installment of Baptist Bios. Let us know if there's somebody maybe that you really are hoping that we will cover. And if he or she is not in one of these two books, we will certainly keep it in mind. And until next time, remember, stay Baptist, our friends. Stay Baptist.